Hi everyone and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. I'm JJ Walsh, your host here in Hiroshima, Japan. And behind me you can hear the beautiful sound of rain. We have rainy season in July right now. And it's always a cool relief, a time to enjoy hydrangeas and uh, getting ready for the hot season after the rains finish. I hope this podcast finds you well and happy wherever you are finding beauty in the things around you. Uh, in this episode, we're talking with Rachel Nicholson. She is a longtime Hiroshima based entrepreneur, and she talks about her story. Being interested in Japanese culture and language from a young age when she was in Maryland in America、uh, by watching anime manga with、uh, English subtitles. And now she is doing that herself as a translator interpreter, providing those links to international people from culture and literature and entertainment in Japan. She also talks about her love of food and being Hiroshima's food snob. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm JJ Walsh in Hiroshima. So happy to talk with another fellow Hiroshima a writer, food, foodie, content creator, translator, interpreter, amazing Rachel Nicholson. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here this morning. This is fantastic. I love your background, by the way. It's so cute. Oh, thank you. Is that a little ghost on your sofa? Yeah,、uh, my friend actually made that for me. It's a little, a little ghost. Oh,、yeah. <laughs> I love it. Now, Rachel, you're so active on Instagram. You work with all the local media companies in Hiroshima on different、uh, presenting projects where you're in front of the camera. You're also very active behind the camera. Doing、yes. translation, interpreting, subtitles. You also do、uh, a lot of interpreting and work with our local Kagura performances. That's right.、Um, is there anything? And then you're working in the city office. You're doing <laughs> so much. Yeah. How, how, how do you balance all of these amazing? Different projects that you're doing?、Uh, it's, not, it's not easy. <laughs> it's just not easy.、Um... Yeah, I have a, a full time job working at Hiroshima City Hall、uh, in the internationalization division. And what that means is I am essentially like the, I am one of two main translators for the city.、Um, so, news articles, notices,、uh, information about like benefits for、uh, raising kids or for single parent families,、uh, speeches by the mayor. Messages to embassies, to foreign leaders,、uh, any of those sort of official communique.、Uh, all that translation is usually run by myself.、Uh, and then we have a team of four people who we sort of all check over our work and make sure it's the best that it can be before it goes out, which is,、um, I would venture to say, kind of rare here in Hiroshima、um, to have that many people who can look over your work.、Uh, And ensure that you haven't made any small mistakes or that you're understanding the Japanese properly.、Um, so, in addition to <laughs> working at City Hall,、uh, I have several other side、uh, gigs. One of them is, of course,、uh, writing food articles for Get Hiroshima.、Uh, I was involved in the G7.、Uh, so, the Japanese government commissioned a series of videos for、um, residents of Hiroshima from each of the G7 countries. Uh, and we were featured in an article.、Uh, we were also featured in a video that sort of highlights the work that we're doing、uh, in Hiroshima. Mine was all about food.、Um, so、uh, I sort of have become this, like, in a weird way, almost like an ambassador of, of the US just by being in this, like, article, which I didn't really、uh, expect or intend. <laughs> But、uh, so just sort of being this,、uh, you know, This American living in Hiroshima who does translation.、Um, and because、uh, I ran previously, I ran a cafe, which meant that local media、uh, picked us up a lot. So、um, Hiroshima has four TV、uh, broadcasting companies, which is kind of a lot for like just Hiroshima. <laughs> But they all, usually, if there's a new restaurant that opens, each of them go and they sort of、uh, give them a little bit of free press. And because of that, the television broadcasting station sort of got to know. Who I was, and they knew that I did translation. So 
they would often come to me asking for, for help with translation projects or to be on uh, TV spots. Um, so that's sort of how I got involved in like the, the television uh, bit. <laughs> and then just sort of having those connections sort of fosters further connections. So I've been really lucky in that people kind of, they know me now after being in Hiroshima for 16 years. Uh, people kind of know me as like the person to go to when they need a translation, uh, especially when it comes to things like uh, tourism, the history of Hiroshima, and also Kagura, which I got into in a very unexpected way. <laughs> so I just sort of have a lot of opportunities that I was very fortunate to have come to me. Um, but when it comes to Kagura, I... Uh, I had this uh, acquaintance, this friend, who she was the former head of the Hiroshima Interpreters Guide Association, who was running a Kagura performance every Saturday geared towards international tourists. So Kagura, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a traditional performing art, sort of similar to Kabuki. Um, and it has very extravagant costumes. Uh, the stories are generally like old Japanese legends. It's very exciting and fast paced and there's like wigs and makeup and and like smoke machines and it's about 40 each performance is about 45 minutes long which makes it really easy for tourists to come and, and watch and go back home um and so they wanted to put english subtitles because it's all in this very old school style of japanese so think like shakespearean english and then sort of push that back a little so maybe like almost a, kind of like a beowulf level of bizarre old japanese so I'm, I'm showing on the screen now some of your subtitle work. So we've got, you. oh, glorious joy. My prayers have been heard. Thanks be to the gods for this tremendous gift of power. So it's very poetic style of subtitles and translation, right? Yeah, it's a lot. I have like full creative control over the uh, project. And I never, at the time when I first got the offer to do it, I had only seen Kagura once and I was really like fascinated by it because it was so like eye catching. Um, and I'd never translated anything like theatrical or dramatic before. So it was really fun to kind of like find like what voice I thought was like suitable. So if you were to like go back and look at like my older, uh, like my really early subtitle work for uh, Hiroshima Kagura, it's very different to how it is now because I was still sort of finding my footing. Because um, I didn't want it to be like too Shakespearean where people would be like, I don't know, there seemed to be like a weird disconnect for me to make it Shakespearean when it wasn't really. Um, but I still wanted to keep the really intense, dramatic sort of flair because when they speak their lines, it's some of the lines are spoken, some of them are kind of sung almost. And I really wanted to keep that like essence. Sorry, I can yeah. hear you. I can hear you. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. I'm, I'm sorry. I have no idea what happened. I'm no, so no, it's, it's a ghost in the system. No worries. I just wanted to point out that in this picture here, uh, you are one of the, the translators for the English Kagura performance. So when we have this in-person performance, uh, and then we have questions and answers at the end. So not only doing subtitles, but doing that part, which I expect is a bit more challenging, right? Yeah. Uh, so during the, the Saturday and evening of Kagura performances for international visitors, what we did is after the show, uh, they did a Q&A session. So they would have the audience there and they would ask for questions. And what they would do is they would do a live interpretation uh, of the questions from English to Japanese and then the answers from Japanese to English. Uh, so it was really interesting because they would do these performances pretty regularly at the time. This is pre-COVID. Um, and what we would get is a lot of the same questions because you'd have different audience members each time. Um, so once I'd gone to the event, you know, five or six times, I kind of expected probably these questions were going to be asked. So that made my job a little bit easier, but sometimes you get thrown curveballs with questions that you really don't expect and aren't really sure how to handle. Um, so it definitely keeps you on your toes every time you do uh, any kind of interpretation, and it's certainly much more difficult than translation. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people use them interchangeably, the two terms, but uh, translation is always from a written source and interpretation is from a, a spoken source. Mm -hmm. So you really have to sort of have your brain on like uh, like full alert because you have to be actively writing down what people are saying 
And then you sort of had to put that into your, your second language or your first language, depending on where you're going from. And then you had to listen to the answer that's being given to you in a different language, furiously write that down and then put it into another language. And it's so exhausting. <laughs> it's wow. really difficult. Yeah. That's so hard. And I, I remember going to uh, some of the English Kagura performances. It's always something we recommend to visitors. I really hope they'll bring it back soon. It was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but you could see how you guys were like preempting the most common questions by explaining. Yes. And so then that cut down on time. So each time you were getting more efficient and fluid um, and then pointing out things that visitors often miss, right? Yes. Like when they're spinning and the costumes change, right? And then asking them to demonstrate that in slow motion. Um, so really adding a lot of depth of experience to the visitor, I think, in that way, right? Yeah, it was definitely... Uh, if you go to a regular Kagura performance, it's just a performance and then it's over. Um, but by giving uh, the international uh, tourists sort of the, and not even just tourists, but also just like international residents living in Hiroshima as well, giving them the chance to sort of see how the performance works. Because there's a lot of little like costume stage tricks that they do that um, you don't really get to see that sort of behind the scenes when you go to see a regular uh, performance. So it was really this like nice little extra bonus where you sort of got to see not only the performance and and talk to the the performers and the the head of the Kagura troops but you also sort of got a little like behind the scenes look at like how the magic happens uh which i thought was pretty uh it was an amazing deal considering i think at the time the ticket prices were 1000 yen which is about ten dollars give or take uh and you got so much out of that <laughs> out of that like measly ten dollars <laughs> A very good value, I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, now, one of the first ways that we met was when you were running a shokudo. Now, yeah. shokudo is a, a Japanese old diner style. Uh, you did the beautiful design of the of the diner, and you said one of the original reasons you got interested in Japanese was because of anime and maybe old films. Is that somehow connected to why you wanted to start a shokudo? So yeah, my original uh, introduction into Japanese language was actually, um, this is a very 90s reference, Sailor Moon uh, started to air in, in the US, it was dubbed. Uh, and it was just this, it's a magical girl anime. Um, I'm sure most people know. <laughs> and it was just this really magical, uh, like not, it was just like, like nothing I'd ever seen. And I had a neighbor at the time uh, who had a son and daughter who were around my age and they really liked anime and they introduced me to lots of other different anime. And that's where I first started to listen to the Japanese language. And I just thought it was so like expressive and so different. And I'd always really loved uh, learning languages. So I I'd studied French for a very long time and it's just sort of interesting to, to study language. And I thought, wow, like Japanese, it's like so different from English. and. This is like very early days of the internet. So anybody from the States watching might know America Online was like the only way to connect to the internet at that time. And you could find a lot of resources for like beginning, like beginners learning Japanese. And so I kind of started to sort of look at those sort like sources and tried to like figure out how to write in like hiragana, katakana. Uh, and just like, I would just like write it everywhere because I thought it looked very cool. And like nobody was studying Japanese around me except for me. So it was like my own little secret, like code kind of thing. I was a really cringy, embarrassing child, but <laughs> uh, it was just, I, I really liked it and I really wanted to sort of pursue it. And uh, there was actually at a, a local community college offered um, a beginner's Japanese class uh, at night for like, anybody to take. And I found it in the like the course book and I was like, mom, I really want to do this. And my mom was a saint. So after work, she would drive me to this uh, Japanese language class. So it was like me and just like a bunch of other people, like all, all different ages, like learning Japanese together. And my teacher, uh, like Simpson Sensei, she was a, a Nisei, so she was a second generation Japanese. And she was just this lovely, lovely lady. And after the course was over, I asked her, I was like, is there any way I can continue studying Japanese? Because um, I was still in high school at the time. And she said, well, at a different college, a different local college, 
they do、uh, a Japanese school for like Japanese like second generation kids, and also for the students at that university. So I think if you ask, they'll probably let you join. So、uh, it was on a Sunday for about three hours, and I was quite far from where I lived at the time. And I said, "Mom, this is this Japanese class, and I really want to join." And she said, "Okay," and she would drive me all the way、uh, up to to Townsend. If anyone's from Maryland and knows where Townsend is, I'm sure my dad is watching. He knows.、Uh, she would drive me up to Townsend, and、uh, I took the Japanese classes there with a different、uh, sensei and. Another lovely lady, and I just I loved it so much because it the grammar is completely backwards from English.、Uh, it's just so different, and like was just fascinating to me. So that's how I really got into studying Japanese.、Um, when it came to opening、uh, the restaurant, a lot of the inspiration for that actually came from well, first of all, just a love of、uh, cooking and baking, which I got from my mom.、Um, Uh, we had a chef at the time who I opened the the shokudo with, and we took inspiration from a, the Japanese film called、um, Kamome Shokudo, just Seagull Cafe,、uh, which is set in Finland, I believe, and it's about this Japanese woman who opens a cafe in Finland. And the design of the cafe is very simple,、uh, like that sort of sky blue color you see there is used often in the film. And when we were looking for places to open. Uh, there was the building that we found was run by this woman who she's probably in her seventies at the time, and she was unmarried, still single. She loved photography. She had this case full of like camera lenses, and she had her photos all over the. It was just a small little cafe at the time, and、uh, she had bought the entire building when she was in her thirties, which is for a Japanese woman to be single at that time and buy a building is pretty revolutionary. Um, and she had bought the entire building, three floors, and she just was, you know, ready to like retire and stop working. And she really took a shine to us, and we were able to、um, get to me and the chef.、Uh, we were able to buy or to rent the first floor to make、uh, our cafe. And at the time,、uh, there were a lot of really interesting coincidences that came together to make the the restaurant happen.、Um, so the So the property, the the first floor, it, it was quite old, and the owner didn't have a blueprint. And the reason this is important is because when you're trying to renovate、uh, a property, not from scratch, but from like the existing like what it is,、uh, you sort of need a blueprint to know where everything is. So where is the water coming from? Where is the electricity coming from? All of that. And she didn't have one. And so, at the time,、uh, a friend of mine who runs a bagel shop in the city, Chelsea Bagel, people in Hiroshima, delicious, go.、Uh, she had a regular customer who was an architect, and a really good architect. And he's this.、Uh, his name is Yamasaki-san, and he is this giant Japanese guy who's built like a fridge. He's very square, and he has this very quirky, interesting personality. And she introduced us, and we told him that you know we, we want to start this cafe, and we don't have a blueprint, and we're not sure what to do, but like we're really excited, and and he just kind of takes a look at me, and he goes, "This sounds like a, like an interesting project." He's like, "Let me let me help you out." So he went to the 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 cafe, and he would order some coffee from the previous owner, and he sat down and he he drew the entire blueprint for us. He, he measured everything, and he found out where things were. He created this blueprint for us, and and he was like, "Hey, you know, like if you, what do you, what do you want to do with the space?" And I was like, "Well, at the time, it was just a counter. You know, there wasn't that like tile、uh, division between the counter and the back." And we're like, "Well, we want to kind of have like a division there, and you know, the the chairs at the time were this really gaudy orange color, so we want to kind of change that to blue." Uh, yeah, you see those blue chairs? They used to be orange.、Uh, that tile、uh, divider wasn't there before. Also, the floor was a completely different color. So we want to retile the floor, and we had a lot of things we wanted to do to sort of make it our own space. And he's like, "All right, let me introduce you to this this company that makes tiles, and let me introduce you to this guy that does paint." And and this is a very I found out much later that this is an architect who's worked with、um, Tadao Ando, who is one of the biggest architects in Japan. And he did all of this work for us for free. He didn't charge us. He just thought it was fun. 
And this is the kind of person that he is. And he helped us paint things and he taught us how to do, you know, how to, how to like lay tiles. He also had another one of his contractor friends teach us how to do it. So we could do the work ourselves and just have to pay for supplies. Uh, and then at the, so my friend who ran the bagel shop, her partner uh, had, um, what is it? He was an electrician, like a certified electrician. And he did all of our wiring and all of our lights just for parts. He didn't charge us for labor. Like all of these people who we had known, you know, for maybe like a year, but we were just like their regular customer. We hadn't really gone out and done a lot of stuff together. And they just all sort of came together and decided to help us just, just because like out of the goodness of their hearts. And if it wasn't for these people, that restaurant wouldn't have existed. And that's the kind of like place that's that amazing is. i know right it's really that's incredible. What, amazing and that's that's one of the things i loved about that g7 interview that you did you were talking about you think like hiroshima community is really built around food culture and um, you gave the example of taking a tokyo friend to one of your favorite bars and she said she was going to go wander around sightseeing the next day and you yeah. didn't have time to take her around and so many local people in the bar volunteered to take her, yeah. right? Yeah, so they beautiful. were like, uh, they were like, oh, really? Uh, so, all right, why don't we meet at three o'clock at this place? We'll, we'll all go get drunk and then we'll, we'll see from like, we'll go from there. Uh, that's just the kind of like place that Hiroshima is. Like the, the people here, there's so many different communities that exist. Uh, and being a part of any one of those communities, uh, it's like having this big extended family who are like, oh, have you been to this place? Or do you know this person? Like, let me introduce you. Uh, and it's just, it's sort of something that I don't think is exclusive to Hiroshima, but I, I think it's definitely uh, unique. Um, my friend from Tokyo, when she came, she was like, this would never happen in Tokyo. I wouldn't just like go to like a, a bar and be able to like meet people. Uh, and they took her out the next day and she had like the time of her life and, and she really had a good time. And I was just like, like what, a, what a crazy, nice thing to do for like a person you just met. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Now, before we move on from the Shokudo uh, talk, one of the most amazing things that I still dream about, Rachel, is your amazing honey toast. Oh, no, we've lost Rachel. Oh, there she is. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Tell us about this amazing creation, Honey Toast. Okay, so uh, Honey Toast is a massive piece of bread. <laughs> that's uh, right there. I think the, that's the tall size, which is uh, eight centimeters. So it's like a it's, big. It's like half a loaf of bread. Essentially, right? yeah. Yeah. And uh, so Honey Toast is originally a Japanese uh, kisaten, which is like an old school cafe creation where they take a... a not that big, but like a thick cut piece of toast. Uh, they sort of cut uh, around the crust. You cut like a diamond pattern into the middle. Uh, you toast it, you put some like butter, some honey and some ice cream on top and you call it a day. Lovely. Uh, and I was like fascinated by the concept of honey toast because it's just like, like nothing I had ever had before. Um, so I knew that when we were gonna uh, open our show, I knew I wanted to do honey toast, but I wanted to do it in like a big way. Um, so we had two sizes, we had like the really massive one that you see there, and then we had like a half size of that. Um, and so I really wanted to like, if it's just like honey and vanilla ice cream, it's kind of easy to get bored with eating it. So what I did is I decided, okay, why don't we use, instead of just honey, we'll have honey, maple syrup, um, caramel syrup, chocolate syrup, so four different sauces which is a lot <laughs> and then um so fresh seasonal fruit um so it would sort of change with the seasons uh and then i baked uh these like cookie plates that said honey toast on it and then i also had in the back there's a spoon shaped cookie as well so i really wanted to like make it very decorative like an event like a festive like you you really like this is like one of our big centerpiece desserts um and in in the beginning so the first for the first two years of the restaurant, I was making all of the bread myself, uh, which is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, so I, it was like homemade bread, 
uh, we had this really amazing vanilla ice cream that I had found from a supplier that was like a gelato. So very smooth, very like creamy. Um, and then for the bigger one, we added a scoop of chocolate ice cream as well, just, just to add more stuff. Um, and so we had this very, this is before Instagram became a thing. So we had this very striking visual. Um, and then once Instagram became a thing, which is probably in like our, I want to say like our fourth year of being open, we were open for eight years. Uh, around that time, uh, people really started to get into like the, like very Instagrammable food. And I just happened to already have this very Instagrammable thing. Uh, so it, it really took off even more after that. Cause there weren't a lot of cafes offering honey toast at the time. And if they were, it wasn't to the degree that we were offering it. Um, so it became kind of like this. Everybody knew our, our restaurant for honey toast and for omurice, which is like a, a chicken rice with an omelet on top of it. And those sort of became the two like mainstays of, of Cafe Cinnamon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. And uh, yeah, I've never I've never found that cinnamon toast equal anywhere else exactly. <laughs> you you've done it you you've put it in my memory forever I love it. <laughs> now was it around like doing the shokudo and then you really developed this passion as the hiroshima food snob uh where does it where does this come from just you just love eating so hiroshima food snob came uh after uh we we called it quits with the shokudo and I was working in a completely different job. At the time, I was working at a dentist office as a dental assistant. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, it was it was fine. And I just remembered thinking that there's so many independent, small uh, restaurants in Hiroshima that are really... And, like, I know how much work and how much heart it takes to, to run your own place. And I just remembered thinking, like, I really want to somehow support and like get these places to be a little more like known because you know it's like if you're in the the like the restaurant community so if you owned a restaurant you worked at a restaurant you kind of you know you know all the really good places but like for people who maybe they're just visiting Hiroshima for the first time or they just moved here there wasn't a lot of information in English um so I was like what if I just started an Instagram account just to sort of help promote local uh independent places and I wanted to do it in Japanese and in English because I, I knew that I really wanted to like help the international community as well sort of like learn about these incredible places that they might not have a menu in English and they might not be able to talk to you in English, but they can make really good food. Uh, so that's how the Hiroshima food snob, and I wanted a name. I really spent a long time coming up with a name because I was like, I need a name that sort of uh, has Hiroshima in it, has something to do with food. And also I'm really, uh, a snob when it comes to food. <laughs> I have very high standards. Um, and I wanted to make sure people knew that when they looked at my page, they weren't just getting standard run of the mill, like, oh, there's a Starbucks over there, there's a Tully's over there. Uh, I wanted to make sure people knew that they were getting kind of like a curated, like best of Hiroshima when they came. So yeah. I thought, thought of the word snob and I was like, oh, Hiroshima food snob. That's awesome. I'm always disappointed. You know, like we, we've had borders open this year, so we're seeing more visitors come back. Mm -hmm. Now, Hiroshima has exceptional coffee roasters. We have yeah. great coffee shops. And Rachel, you are always uh, introducing so many of our great shops. And we actually met uh, years ago. I can't believe this is four years ago. I know. We did a little short video about the Hiroshima Coffee Festival, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I remember very well because that was the first uh, Hiroshima Coffee Festival. Uh, and uh, <laughs> what happened was um, COVID happened the year, I think it was maybe like that year, like the year of the festival. And then it just never sort of got off the ground again. Because uh, it was organized by Progress Lifestyle Coffee, which is um, it's on uh, Chuodori, and it's this amazing little shop uh, run by this barista named Yuji. And Yuji sort of is part of sort of like the fabric of the coffee, third wave coffee culture of Hiroshima. And he is really trying to sort of make coffee culture more of a thing, more of a thing that people are like know about, can access. Um, and he's really good at pooling all of the roasters and baristas to do things. And um, 
So the coffee festival was preceded by the first ever uh, latte art competition that they did, um, which was also really exciting. But then COVID happened and like nobody could do anything. And then it just kind of like fell by the wayside, which is really unfortunate because it was such a great event that I think only one of the roasters there was from um, Fukuoka in Kyushu, but the rest of them were all roasters from Hiroshima. And that's actually how I discovered one of my favorite roasters in Hiroshima, which is Shimaji Coffee Roasters, run by uh, Shima-san. And they specialize in light roast coffee. And all of the coffees that they have, which they, they usually have at least like eight or nine different types of coffee at any given time. They have two locations. Um, and light roast coffee, to me growing up, uh, shout out to my dad for always drinking coffee. Uh, the coffee that my dad would be drinking is was very coffee coffee. So bitter, black, strong, kind of like, you know, very, very like your, what you think of when you think of coffee. And so I didn't really like coffee. Even when I was running my cafe, like cafe, like tea was my drink of choice. I, I didn't really like coffee, which is bizarre because it's like, uh, hello, you're running a cafe and you don't like coffee. Like, that's weird. <laughs> so uh, when I went to uh, Progress for the first time, I would always drink like lattes. So like espresso and milk. Like if it has milk in it, I, you know, like I'd probably be like, okay with it without adding sugar. That was like my, my baby step into the world of coffee. Um, and so, yeah, there you go. Uh, there's a lot of, yeah, really gorgeous, uh, design cappuccino work. Uh, their lattes are also beautifully designed and the espresso that they use there is very, I would venture to say like light, it's not super heavy. So it's very like milky, very creamy. Um, it's very, even if you don't really like coffee, you probably will have no problem drinking these lattes. So I was very into lattes. And then when I went to the Hiroshima Coffee Festival, uh, it was the first time I'd ever had any coffee from Shimaji Coffee Roasters. And they had this, um, I believe it was a cold brew coffee, um, which cold brew is just coffee that's been, uh, you mix it with water and then you put it in the fridge for a while and you kind of let it do its thing. So it's very like, uh, it's light, it's very easy to drink and very fruity. So the coffee that they were using I remember looking at the iced coffee and thinking, this looks like iced tea. Like this, like the color of iced tea. Um, yeah, exactly, kind of like that. Um, that is a cold brew uh, tonic. And so this very iced tea sort of looking color. And I remember drinking it and feeling like I was drinking iced Like it didn't feel like coffee. It tasted like super like lemony, very citrusy. And I just, like my mind was blown. I was like, how is this coffee? Like, I didn't know coffee could be so good. And, and so that's sort of how I got really into like, oh, like light roast coffee is a completely, sorry, my earphones keep falling out. <laughs> it's a completely different beast to, uh, to like the dark roast coffee. So like the very coffee coffees that I thought coffee was. Uh, and so I, that's how I ended up sort of asking the baristas about like different uh, coffee roasters around the city, like independent roasters, which there are. Goodness, there's a lot now. Um, yeah, there, there's Progress roasts their own coffee. Shimaji Coffee Roasters does their own coffee. Akam Coffee Works roasts their own coffee. Uh, Breath in Dambara, which is a, a little bit of a hike, but they do uh, not only light roast, but dark roast and medium roast as well. Um, and there's a lot of uh, coffee shops in Hiroshima that sort of do, uh, that use their coffee beans. Um, and everybody just has their own sort of everybody's coffee is slightly different the way they roast it is slightly different like it's just absolutely spoiled for choice currently there's bagtown coffee which also does a variety of single origin coffees from light roast to dark roast uh so it's in the past few years i would say i would say maybe in the past five years we've seen this kind of like upswing in this like single origin specialty third wave coffee shops uh, yeah, so that's and I, I know you're a fan of Yuya Coffee as well. Yeah, and Yuya Rose. Some really interesting things with uh, roasting rice as well. Right? So what he's, what he's doing is he's trying to make coffee. So coffee beans uh, are sort of there's a lot of like diseases that they can fall prey to, uh, and it's 
he's trying to, he does a lot of work with sustainability, much like you. And he's trying to sort of find a way to, so let's just say a lot of the, the strain of coffee bean that they use for coffee uh, is also with climate change, it's, it's getting harder and harder to harvest the amount that they need. So what he did is he created this blend called Rico, uh, which uses coffee, but it also uses roasted uh, rice from Hiroshima. And um, actually recently they started to sell it at the, um, the antenna shop in Tokyo for Hiroshima, Tao, they have this little shop that uh, focuses on Hiroshima specialty goods and products and actually his coffee beans. So that Rico blend has been chosen uh, to, to be marketed there, which is amazing. Um, and Yuya is, uh, I think he's still in his 20s. He's this really great guy who he loves like the outdoors and hiking. And he has usually his coffee is very dark roast coffee, super dark roast. But he also makes this incredible um, roasted green tea, so hojicha. So he roasts the green tea with like a little bit of like caramel rock sugar. And it makes this very caramelly, toasty, like it's the best hojicha latte I've ever had. Like everywhere else, it just, it's not good enough. Because <laughs> like, you can you can't I remember, really eat I remember finding tea. Yuya uh, at Yokogawa. There was a festival, outdoor festival, mm -hmm. and he's roasting something over a fire. And I was like, oh, what is he roasting? Is it like chestnuts? Is it like popcorn? And then I was like, no, wait, it's coffee. So he's <laughs> roasting it over the fire, and then he grinds it in front of people, and then he makes the most beautiful coffee and tea. So yeah. very impressive guy, very innovative. It's wonderful yeah. to see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about some of the summer foods that you love because you've got so many really unique things. I love this. It's like a shiso genovese that you found. Uh, yeah, at so Mio. This, this is at Mio Bar. Um, this is back when, so Mio Bar has gone through a, a staff upheaval of late. So they've kind of like switched around a lot of people. I think their main chef actually opened his own restaurant in Shimane. Uh, so this is actually one of his uh, works. So they use green shiso leaves, which you see a lot in the summer. Um, they're like these very sort of like, they're these massive leaves. And when you so make pesto... People usually eat it with um, sashimi or sushi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's used what a, most people equate it with, right? Yeah. And you can also see it with like um, on top of like uh, tempura rice bowls, so like tendon as well. And in the summertime is when the, the green leaves, there's also um, red leaves as well, but usually the summer is when the green leaves come out. And um, generally when you make pesto, you're usually using basil. Uh, and another name for, for shiso is like Japanese basil. Uh, and it has this really, oh, how do you describe the taste of shiso? It's very fragrant, extremely fragrant, very bright. Um, not unlike a basil, but it doesn't have that characteristic basil flavor. It has this very like shiso flavor. And so when they were making the pesto, instead of using basil, they used shiso. And it just gives you this like amazingly fragrant dish. Um, and actually we made a version of this uh, at Cinnamon a while back. And that's how I actually was like, because we couldn't find fresh basil. So we we're like, what if we use shiso? Uh, and I was really glad to see uh, that, that somebody else caught on to that. I think that was actually a chilled pasta dish. Uh, and it was just so like lovely and like refreshing almost because it has not like a citrus kick, but kind of like that sort of acidity to it a little bit. Yeah, uh, it was really good, really, really good. Awesome. Yeah. And then one of one of the places we actually did a video together also four years ago. This is too long ago. Uh, we were at Taiko <laughs> Udon. Now mm -hmm. you have uh, recently introduced Taiko Udon's amazing sudachi. And this is such a beautiful summer dish. And yeah. maybe, maybe from Shikoku is where sudachi udon comes from. Yeah, sudachi is mostly known. Uh, so it's a very small citrus fruit, about yay big. Um, and they get a lot of them from Shikoku. Um, and I believe that's where it, it comes from. And I remember uh, so Taiko Udon did this chilled sudachi uh, udon. And like, it's, it's so striking because the entire like surface is covered with these thin slices of sudachi. And sudachi has, has like a lime sort of vibe to it. Uh, very bright, very acidic, very refreshing. And to have that with like a chilled soup 
it was so it's because it has that brightness it goes really well with like dashi and with salt um and so it was just really refreshing like like a lemonade kind of like ah oh, this is what i need in the summer sort of feeling and that photo actually uh i was contacted by this this french uh magazine who was doing like a an article on like different like summer like refreshing dishes in japan and they wanted to use my photo because they really liked it um it's very very like instagrammable but also like super delicious so yeah it um, is definitely... so gorgeous and of course you can eat the rind you can eat i do i eat the yeah, entire yeah. thing seasonal yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now one other thing you introduced uh when we did the taiko udon video together um, you introduced about the seven herb seasoning, the seven spice. Yes, 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 yes. So there's a uh, shishimi. Uh, is it's a blend of seven different spices uh, that they're a bit spicy, um, and they're it's usually Kyoto. I think is the the most like well known place uh, to get shishimi, and it's used as like a, a condiment, a kind of a topping. Um, for udon and for like various other things um so it's got like uh i think that one had uh black sesame and like red pepper and then there's like a whole bunch of other things in it and it's really like a standard kind of like japanese seasoning you can find it like soba places udon places uh tempura places as well um and it's got this nice kind of kick to it so if you're a fan of like spicy things then it's definitely uh something that i would recommend you put on like any kind of standard udon dish, probably not the like sudachi one, but if you're just getting like standard udon with like, uh, I, I don't know, tempura on top, or maybe like some uh, like kitsune udon, things like that, it definitely adds a nice little kick, yeah. Yeah, I love it. And I think that's something people see all over Japan and they're mm -hmm. never quite sure what it is. Right? <laughs> like, what is this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let's talk Kakigori because you yes. introduced a lot of great Kakigori places. Like this one on Miyajima, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Miyajima has this amazing little Kakigori place that's right near Iwaso, which is this massive old yokan where the G7 uh, leaders actually had lunch on Miyajima, so it's a very high class yokan. Uh, and so the kakigori place there, I had heard about it. I think I, I saw a photo on Instagram and was like, sauce like on top, and then it had like a yogurt sort of sauce on the, the bottom. And so blueberries is that the places that do it do it extremely well. Like you can tell they're using ice that's of really high quality because it's very like, it's very fluffy. It's kind of melts almost like a powdery snow kind of way that it melts in your tongue. It's not like rocky, you know, it's not gonna be like crunchy. You're not biting through like cubes and big bits of ice. It's like really nice, like uniformed and like like flaky and beautiful, yeah. Yeah, well, Hawaii is so famous for shave ice. Yeah, and I was it, gonna say. It comes, it comes from Japan. It comes from Japanese immigrants to Hawaii. Matsumoto shave ice, he was Japanese, right? Oh, wow. So this this comes from Japan and maybe Hiroshima. I've never found out where he's from. Um, oh. There's another place you introduced, Yukiboshi. Yeah, this Yuki looks Boshi. amazing. So Yukiboshi is, um, they are an exclusive like uh, shaved ice specialty shop that's all they serve um and they're open year-round which is that's bold <laughs> to be open in the winter time and serving shaved ice um so basically the the shop serves uh just seasonal shaved ice this is pistachio and raspberry um and they use a lot of local ingredients as well they use fresh seasonal ingredients so this was during uh the summer and raspberries are in season um they have it like passion fruit one that I've had. Uh, they have ones with like pineapple. Uh, in the fall, they do a sweet potato one. Um, like they just have, and they have like the regular lineup of, you know, like strawberry, whatever. Um, but you just, there's these like amazing, like beautiful, like creations of, and the, the ice that they use is also like 100% like naturally like created ice from spring water. It's like, you know how usually when you eat something cold too quickly, you get like an ice cream headache? There's there's none of that because it melts so like quickly 
and it's not just like this like rush of cold. So that's how you know when you have a really good like uh, shaved ice is when you don't get like an ice cream headache eating it because you know they're using really good quality ice. And just the syrups are all handmade, which is incredible. They use fresh fruit. If you go to the shop, you can see there's always like fruit like behind the counter. Um, and they have an Instagram where they post like their menu and what they have and then like what's going to be coming up next. Because generally, you usually have about a month before they move on to like different flavors. So if you have something that you want to try, like you really have to like go and get it. Um, obviously in the summertime, uh, the line can be quite long. And the interesting thing is they keep the inside of the store quite warm, even in the summertime. And because you're eating, you know, shaved ice. So if you have like a really like heavily air conditioned place and you're eating shaved ice, it's going to be freezing cold because your body's going to be like, but uh, because they keep it at a warmer temperature, by the time you're done eating, it's like the perfect, like you don't feel too cold. You don't feel like really hot. So they've like finagled with the temperature in this really amazing way that like, it's, it's truly bizarre when you walk in, you're like, oh, it's like kind of like warm in here and it's like hot outside. And then you like finish and you're like, oh, it's perfect in here. <laughs> well, that's wild. Yeah. Uh, that's, so that's, yeah. I, I'm just keep waiting. When is Rachel going to write the book about Hiroshima food and coffee and sweet culture? Because I think we need it. We need you to write a book. Let's let's put that into the universe. If there's any publishers that want to offer me a deal. Let's and just put, yeah. More than half to write there. a book about Hiroshima and all the good food that they have. Well, it's, it's interesting because we get so much social media from all of, usually mm -hmm. the big cities. Uh, we've got Tokyo, we've got Osaka, we've got Fukuoka foodies all the time mm -hmm. just showing us how amazing their food is. But we have you, Rachel, and you are sharing how great Hiroshima food is. It's important. Yeah, I mean, it's it deserves it deserves some spotlight, honestly. Like, to have this much good food. And the thing about Hiroshima, so, like, when you look at cities like Tokyo that are massive, they've got food places on every corner. And, like... If you have that many options in that many places, you don't really have to be that good because you have so many people there who are going to go. Um, and then that's why I have friends who move from Hiroshima to Tokyo and they're like, there are lots of places, but none of them are really that good because you don't really have to be. But Hiroshima is a very conservative city. And uh, like when you first open a shop there, like they'll go because they want to know what the deal is. But if you're not good enough, I mean, you see places close down within three months. Like people here, they'll just stop going if it's not good because it's like you can be a little more discerning here because there's less of a population for sure. Um, and so if you're if you want to survive in a place that has less of a population that like if you're not good enough to compete with the places they always go to, they're just not going to go. So you have this environment that creates this sort of like standard for like how like acceptable food should be. And like, obviously there are places, you know, that are not great in Hiroshima as well, but the majority, I would say, there's this really high standard. And also the fact that you can get really fresh ingredients locally. So you can get fresh seafood because we're right on the Seto Inland Sea, which is one of the, the most, uh, I think, the biggest catches of fish in Japan, a lot of them come from the Seto in the sea. Uh, we also have a lot of farmland. Uh, so p people who are raising, you know, vegetables and we have fruit and we also have like, uh, like dairy farms um, and, and like Wagyu farms and, and pork, like all of these regional specialties that are literally in your own backyard. So you can, as opposed to like Tokyo where it's harder to get maybe like the absolute like freshest in like this certain ingredient, it's very easy for it to, to come here without having to like travel a really long way. Yeah. Well, one of the things I know you're not quite ready to open up a shokudo again. I'm sad about that. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to. <laughs> uh, you do you do pop ups every now and again, but you are very active in making bread. Yes. Now, I talked to Thomas Kleffer, our organic farmer in Hiroshima yesterday. He's growing wheat. Um, nice. There's another organic Nagano Naturally, Heather, she's growing wheat. Um, are you able to find good local wheat grown in Japan for your breads? So uh, I think the first uh, locally grown wheat that I actually purchased was from uh, Nao, Nao's farm um, in Akitakata. 
And uh, so the interesting thing about using local wheat versus, yeah, some focaccia that I baked. Uh, so I do sourdough baking, uh, first of all. Uh, I, I do sourdough. I make a starter using rye flour uh, and strong bread flour and water, and that's all I use. And uh, it's been a journey. I started this during COVID, like the rest of the world, and I haven't stopped. <laughs> so the thing about sourdough is that what's important when it comes to flour is the protein content. So if you have a high protein flour, it makes the dough a lot easier to handle. So the standard flour that I was using before I figured all this out or I researched it a little bit more uh, was a little bit lower than the protein content was a bit lower than the protein content of the flour that was being used and like the recipes that I would be uh, like I, I have a lot of different there's a lot of different people doing sourdough baking online and I've, I've sort of you know I pick and choose recipes that I think maybe I could do and the main recipe that I found myself using I didn't realize that the baker was using a really high percentage of protein in their flour because not everybody writes that in their recipe. They'll just put like how many grams. So I found that the flour was really hard to handle. It was a bit, it was sticky. Uh, it wasn't quite rising as much as I wanted it to. And I just couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. So I went online and I was sort of you know, reading more into sourdough and bread baking in general. And uh, it was written somewhere that the high protein content makes it, the dough much easier to handle. It also makes it rise a lot more. Um, so I started to check the protein content before I would buy the flour. And mostly the flour that I've been getting um, is imported. Uh, it's like high, so it's like, they call it like, um, what is it like? So you've got like strong flour is bread flour in Japan. And then they have like super strong flour, which is a high protein bread flour. So I was using that and the results were just so mind-bogglingly different. The only thing that I changed was the flour. So when I saw that now was uh, she was selling like flour that she had grown. So like she, she grew the wheat and then, you know, you grind it and all that. I was really interested to see how that would work because the protein content in that is slightly lower. Um, so it's and not- now San of course is doing it organically, which yes. is awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I love these. I'm showing pictures of your beautiful bread. You are yeah. doing a stunning job. Is Thank it you. has it been getting easier or is it always up and down depending on temperature and stuff? Oh, there are so many factors when it comes to sourdough baking because it is it's a living thing. So the stuff for people who aren't familiar with how sourdough starter works is you have this mixture of flour and water. Uh, and when you mix them together, uh, what happens is that the, so there's this bacteria that you, that I've been cultivating, the, the sourdough sort of like bacteria, and it'll eat the sugars in the flour and it'll produce gas. So it'll rise. Uh, and so you feed it with new flour and water. It, it rises once it's reached its peak, then you use it like you would use a yeast uh, in your baking. But because it's a natural process, uh, it the fermentation takes a lot longer than say using commercial yeast, which is just the concentrated, like these are the actual essential things. So, whereas if you're using yeast, it might take maybe, I don't know, let's say three hours at, at the quickest to make like a loaf of bread uh, with sourdough, uh, for example, making a focaccia or like a, a campagna kind of thing, it takes two days. So you have one day where you're, you know, you're, for your sourdough starter to come to the right height, it generally takes, depending on the weather and the humidity, so the warmer it is, the faster it happens. Uh, generally, if you have it at like just the right temperature, it takes six hours to reach the max maximum peak. Uh, and then you mix that with your water and your flour and your salt, and that's all that goes into the bread. Um, and you have to let that sit for like an hour. And then over the course of two or three hours, you're sort of, you don't really need the dough for sourdough like you would traditional like bread where you're kind of like really getting into it. You sort of stretch it and you fold it over itself and you build the strength that way. So you do this multiple times over the course of two or three hours. You let it sit, you shape it. And then what you do is you put it in for a cold ferment. So you put it in your fridge for, I think you can do it up to two or three days depending on your recipe. I usually do it for about 18 hours. So you let it sit in the fridge 
then you turn it out onto your eye bake in a giant uh, cast iron Dutch oven to create steam. Um, and so you, you turn it out, you preheat your cast iron uh, Dutch oven, and then you, you, know, you put your bread in there, you score it, and you bake it for 45 minutes or whatever. So it takes an entire day to prep and then it takes, you know, at least two or three hours to to do the prep to bake it and then to actually bake it. It's a very long process. And you it don't know sounds, how it's gonna turn out. Sounds like a full time job just as a hobby. <laughs> so I mean your yeah. your passion, you you've done you do so much diverse work, right? You're doing translation, interpreting about peace issues, very heavy. Uh, you're doing tourism work, you're baking bread, you're <laughs> researching and introducing great coffee and local eateries. Um, do you like this kind of diversity? Is that kind of something that interests you or would you like to focus more on one of these areas? I think just with my personality, if I was only doing the same thing every single day, I, I think I would get bored. I think I'd be like, like I'm used to this now. Can we do something different? Um, Cause I, I get, one of my really bad habits is getting really into one thing and then moving on. <laughs> I mean, like, forget about it, um, which is not the best habit to have if you're going to, like, invest in, like, you know, like, I, I was really into embroidery for a while. Um, I, I still sometimes do it, but I, like, you know, I have all this thread, and I was like, oh, look at this color. I'll buy this. I'll buy that. And then it just sort of sits there when you're, like, done with it. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I really, I get bored if I'm just doing the same thing. So for me... I, I kind of like that I'm sort of like a one-stop shop when it comes to translation because like I I translate so many different uh, like from so many different genres I suppose so there's like stuff about Hiroshima and, and the history the atomic bombing peace uh, global issues so I, I work a lot with TSS which is a local TV um, broadcaster and they have a, a segment on YouTube called the archives where they interview uh, Hibaksha, so survivors of the bombing. They also have been, um, they put up short news clips of how Hiroshima is reacting to the war in Ukraine um, and also about the G7 summit. And so I get to translate these, you know, two, three minute, five minute, 10 minute news clips about what Hiroshima, uh, how the people in Hiroshima are reacting and what they're doing. Um, but then I've also done subtitles on, uh, there was a photographer in Tokyo who was working with a camera company and he shot a short video and then he talked about his process. So I got to talk about very in-depth photography related like terminology and, and his creative process. I've done subtitles for interviews for uh, chefs, celebrated chefs and restaurant owners uh, in Tokyo. So working with a Tokyo company called Panicball, it's an incredible company. Um, and so it's like I get the chance to see what other people are doing, learn about their creative process, and then sort of uh, help convey that process to the world in English, which I think is very rewarding for me personally, because there are so many amazing, creative, driven, like, crafts people in, like, not even just in Hiroshima, but in Japan in general, who don't really get their stories told uh maybe as much as they should because there's the language barrier there and so like for me my first foray into japanese was subtitles like watching like anime or movies with english subtitles and that's how that was like the bridge for me and so now to kind of come full circle and be able to be that bridge for somebody else is is really really rewarding for me that i can sort of help tell these people's stories in the way that they deserve to be told that is awesome. And that, what a great way to end the interview. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. I'm really glad we got the chance to chat today. It was really fun. And I can't wait to do videos again with you again in person on location. Yes. Let's Definitely. go find some great places to introduce together. I'd love that. Yeah, I'd love that too. All right. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great weekend. See you next Thank time. You guys. Bye.
Has anyone ever seen a mess like this? Some of us don't mind crying in public. Some of us are just dying to be missed. And you all seem like such nice people. It's truly my pleasure to make your company. Some of our paths may diverge over the years. All of you left a certain mark on me. Don't ever change. I love you just the way you are. So we're a little strange. It's all working out so far. 